L'évolution de la technologie est intrinsèquement liée à l'évolution de l'humanité et des civilisations. Les inventions, l'adoption de nouvelles techniques, de la roue à Internet en passant par l'écriture ou l'électricité, changent le cours des choses, parce qu'elles changent notre rapport au monde, au temps, aux autres et à nous-mêmes. La technologie nous fait autant que nous la faisons. Et depuis quelques décennies, elle a à ce point évolué qu'elle est devenue non seulement omniprésente dans nos vies, mais aussi trop complexe pour qu'on la comprenne. Elle a à ce point évolué qu'on peut se demander aujourd'hui si elle n'est pas en passe de ne plus avoir besoin de nous pour continuer à se développer. Kevin Kelly se pose la question de savoir ce qu'elle veut, puisque selon lui, comme le vivant, l'évolution technologique a une direction, une trajectoire inévitable qui peut-être nous emporte et nous dépasse. Kevin Kelly est un penseur fascinant, un acteur incontournable du monde de la tech depuis 40 ans, entre philosophie, hacking et prospective. Il a entre autres fondé le fameux magazine Wired. Cet épisode est en anglais, activez les sous-titres sur YouTube si ça peut vous aider à le suivre, et sinon je suis preneur si vous souhaitez m'aider à le traduire ou à le doubler. Bonne écoute. This is the most urgent of times and the most urgent of messages. What is real? How do you define real? Our knowledge has made us cynical. Our cleverness hard and unkind. We are in the beginning of a mass extinction. It's about everyone. It's about all of us. It's about potential. It's about possibility. The singularity is probably the right word because we just don't know what's going to happen. How dare you! Hello, Kevin Kelly. First question, very simple. Can you could you briefly introduce yourself and tell me what you're up to right now? My name is Kevin Kelly. I am the senior maverick at Wired Magazine, um, which means that I occasionally write for them, and but I have no other duties there as um, co-founder of the magazine. And now I occasionally write books about what mm, technology means to us, what its um, role is in our lives and particularly the new technology that we're making um so i package ideas about technology okay and you're, and you're also kind of a philosopher when, you, when it comes to technology right yes it's um i take a philosophical view of it and um i have to say to my chagrin um, none of my books have ever been translated into french And I think I have a very French approach to <laughs> to technology, so I'm really kind of uh, hoping that someday um, th my books have been translated in all the other languages except for French. So, oh, really? um, okay. There is a philosophical um, view of um, technology. I, I try to take a large cosmic uh, look at it and trying to figure out what kind of you know in the role of everything else in the universe, what is technology. Yeah, and, and we'll get into this, and uh, I have no idea why your books are not translated, but I hope this podcast will, will help somehow. Uh, so I, I, I started this podcast because I'm, I'm convinced you know, that we live in a very special moment in human history, and I'm trying to make sense of what is actually happening. And I want to understand you know, how our world works and what are the forces and dynamics that shape our future. Um, and as we live in a complex world, I'm talking to all sorts of people who have different point of, point of view on things, like looking at things from different angles. So how do you look at the world? Like you, you say it, and we say that you have a philosophical approach to it, but let's get into this a little bit. What is your, your angle or the, the lens that you use the most or your approach overall to making sense of, of things in general? Yeah, I, I would say, first of all, I have a very tech-centric view, meaning that I think that technology is the most important force happening on the planet. And um, I also think that um, uh, most of the problems that we have um, today are created by yesterday's technology and that most of the problems we'll have in the future will be created by today's technology. But unlike maybe some tech critics, I think the solution to the problems that tech makes is not less technology, but better technology. So, so I have a very tech-centric view. And as part of that tech-centric view, uh, I also think that technology is beyond humans. It's not really like a human endeavor. It's more of a cosmic force in the universe that it's, well, that it will probably appear on many planets in the galaxy Um, and that its origins are at the Big Bang, that it's sort of an extension 
of the same forces that produce life and living things um, are working in the technium, the system of technology. And in a certain sense, you could say, well, it's, it's kind of accelerates the same self-organizing forces that made life are now being accelerated in technology. And so the, in that way, the two life and technology are derived from the same thing. They're, 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 they're brother and sister. They're not really enemies and it's not adversarial between technology and nature they're really from the same stem so so i have this kind of view that um a technology is inherently compatible with nature rather than against it yeah and, and we get into this because it's a very original way of uh, of things of seeing you know how technology works as, as a as a system as a whole that is independent from from other things from other systems even from from humans somehow um, and um, before going into this there's another question that i ask my my guests all the time because my podcast is also related to trying to find out what's going on and I would like to understand how you, what do you think of what we're going through right now? What, according to you, defines the most our very uh, specific era, you know, that time mm -hmm. in the human history and the kind of dynamics and forces mm -hmm. that are shaping present and future? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, I would say, in the, the, the largest lens possible, of, you know, the historical view, like if we were historians talking about this in 500 years about this time i would say that we would see this as sort of the last days of one mm, era and the very first days of of the new era and and the new era is uh that our society our civilization is becoming truly global Um, um, you know, we're kind of in this very difficult process of trying to uh, transcend above national interests, national economies, all this stuff into a, a true planetary kind of society and planetary laws and planetary commerce where, where there's just basically one economy and also one machine, one kind of technological uh, connection where everybody's connected all the time and so um that kind of planetary movement um is what we're beginning to do and one of the things that we'll be working on in the next hundred years is making more and better tools for collaborating uh with each other at scale with with where we can you know, have a million people collaborating in real time, making something together, which has never been possible before. And those people will be all over the globe as they work. And we don't really have kind of tools like that to allow us, but we are beginning to make those tools and we will. So, so, so that's the first one is this kind of movement towards a global planetary super organism. And as part of that, uh, the other second big thing happening is we're at the very beginning of this um, synthetic artificial intelligence um, you know bloom it's it's um, we'll have thousands of different species of AIs doing different things and uh, among the many different AIs will be you know the kind of emergent planetary collective of all humans connected together and all AIs collected together um, producing things. So that will be another one of the many varieties of AI including standalone dumb you know relatively uh, stupider AIs um, but we'll include it among that spectrum of all the possible ways we'll have artificial and synthetic intelligence is, is going to be uh, a global version of some sort or of maybe several sorts. And so um, that introduction of artificial intelligences and synthetic intelligences is at the same level of certainly of industrialization, but probably even bigger than that, maybe the equivalent of uh, printing or, or even language itself. It's, it's a really, really big deal. It will take centuries for it to 
develop and play out. And we're just at the beginning of that. So, so we'll, we'll see this moment as the kind of a transition from, you know, the first level of controlling the planet with technium and automation and electrification and cheap power, which enabled a huge population explosion. And the second thing, we'll have a population deplosion. We're going to implode with a number of people and at the same time introducing millions of artificial minds and, uh, and planetary collaboration. Okay. Well, we'll get into, into, into more, into more details on this because, uh, that's, um, fascinating, you know, to try to, to, to do a little bit of foresight and to imagine, okay, what could happen. That's also one of the things that I'm trying to do. I uh, would like to understand a bit, spend time a little bit more on, uh, uh, your system thinking, you know, how you look at things again, because my way of approaching that complexity is to try to think in systems. You know, it helps me making the difference between what's a symptom and, and a cause or, you know, building, building connections between two topics, two events. And with my previous guests, I spent a lot of time talking about uh, the planet, you know, about the environment, about climate change, you know, which are all the, uh, which is the system that we all live in and to try to make sense of how it's evolving, because as we know, you know, right now it's ending, it's, it's, it's evolving very fast, you know, climate, biodiversity loss, resource depletion. And of course, Earth, the Earth is composed of a number of complex subsystems, uh, the atmosphere, hydrosphere, the biosphere. What do you think of the idea that humans, you know, created other spheres like the no sphere uh, i think imagined by taylor de, Char taylor, taylor de chardin uh, or the which is the system of ideas or the technosphere composed of all the man-made technologies um, i know that you think it's a separate thing but i would like you to explain how and why you think this way yeah i i i, I agree with you 100 in the um the need and necessity to think in systems terms, to take a systems point of view. Uh, in fact, one of the things I try to do with technology is to talk about what I call the technium. You could call it the technosphere. It's the same thing, um, which is the system of all the technologies in the world, and they're all codependent on each other. So you can't make a You can't make anything today without having hundreds of other technologies working to support it in terms of either computers or factories or tools, um, everything. So even to make a very simple thing like a pair of eyeglasses, say, requires hundreds of other technologies from optics, glass making, metal, and design to produce one very simple thing or seemingly simple thing. So all these... Uh, parts or all these technologies are codependent on each other and you and as a system and systems every system no matter it's natural or artificial have agendas i have something about systems is that they have their own internal uh points that they return to they have certain tendencies um that they're biased and so technology has as one of these systems has biases and part of what the thinking in systems terms is to try to uncover what some of these natural biases are in systems and how we can work with them because that's you know we need to we need to be able to steer technology so it requires a kind of a systems view to to steer it and i would say in the technology that's That, that's our job right now is to try and steer this technium, this system. And the, the, the problem, or not problem, one of the problems, one of the challenges is that we ourselves are part of that system. And we're not just, we, we, we play two roles. We play the role of trying to steer it, and we are, we are also what is being steered in the sense that our own humanity Our own selves are technologically part part te part technology at this point that, that that we have been changing ourselves and engineering ourselves in many respects, and so we are both the 
the, the, the creator and the created. We're both the, the parent and the child. We're both the shaper and the shaped. Um, we're, you know, the makers of technology and we're technologically made ourselves to some extent. And so that makes this very complicated assignment to try to steer because, you know, we're being steered at the same time. Yeah, it's not separated from us. Right. And, and, and we'd like to go a little bit deeper into this because, and to spend some time on the on the comparison you make between biology and technology, since this is uh, at the core of the of your book of what technology wants. Because we don't know if life, you know, evolution wants something as a whole. Some people say there is a direction. Some people don't. But there are indeed some principles that drive evolution. For example, you know, the fact that genes want to survive or replicate or the fact that uh, in time, no organisms become more and more complex. Um, how do you apply these principles to technology and how it's evolving? Uh, because that will help people understand, and myself to start with, uh, why we can, we could consider that technology as a whole is uh, is living its own evolution independently from our will. Yeah, and um, you know that's that's a really big question, and basically a, that is the question of the, of the book that I try to answer what technology yeah, wants. There's so, a whole book on that. <laughs> so, so, so to reduce it into to a very um, short thing, I, I would say several things. Um, uh, I, I, I do see the technium and technology as an extension of uh, biology, the natural world, living forces, and so my my premise, my hypothesis, is that um, if you want to kind of understand what where the system of technology is going, we can extrapolate from understanding where life and nature and evolution is going. And as you say, um, that statement is kind of controversial because there are. Um, many evolutionary biologists who say there's absolutely no direction to evolution and there, but there's another subset of, um, of evolutionary biologists who, who says, of, yes, there are directions. And you mentioned one of them, which is this movement towards complexity. The, the other side of the camp would say there's not even the movement towards complexity. That's just an artifact. That's just kind of a, uh, that's not a direction. It's just, a survivor bias but um i'm in the camp that's that endorses the idea that there's directions in evolution itself and um i kind of go through and enumerate some of them uh, a movement from the general to the specific would be another one so everything like it starts off like a general purpose cell that does everything and then over time you evolve or nature evolves much more yeah, specialized. specific and specialized cells so that even in our own human body, we have 57 different varieties of specialized cells, heart cells, uh, bone cells. And technology would have a similar kind of movement where you have kind of a camera that does everything. And then over time you have specialized cell cameras that do underwater photography or infrared photography or high speed photography or high speed underwater photography. So, um, that so I tried to extrapolate what are some of the general trends in biology and life and evolution and say uh, technology is going to have the same ones um, because this is a general these are general trends about all self organized exotropic uh, systems and then the, the, these are sort of the qualities of this exotropic thread and so um, meaning that they are not that they're being powered by entropy, the most fundamental kind of direction in the universe. And so um, uh, I would say, again, it's kind of controversial whether it happens in biology, but if you accept that, that they are in biology, then it's easier to see that it's happening in technology. And so what, what would be these, uh, let's go into these principles. Uh, and you wrote actually another book, The, the Inevitable and it's kind of based on that idea that there is a direction to to the evolution of things and that the invention of a technology sometimes or inevitably leads to the invention of another one, right? Because there are some kind of rules. For example, and I heard you talking about this, 
The telephone was inevitable once we discovered electricity, or internet was inevitable, but not the iPhone, or not the internet in its current form. So when it comes to tech, or to um, you know that layer of technology, what are the things that that you believe are inevitable, and and what are the the principles that are um, determinant for for the future? Yeah. So so the 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 general idea is that. Um, that there's a kind of a developmental sequence in technology, not just evolutionary. So developmental sequence would be the equivalent of what a individual cell would do as it goes through and grows into an adult organism. So there's, there's, there's developmental stages. So it's, you know, it's like a cell it divides, there's a blastosphere, there's a, you know, a fetus, it grows into an infant and then there's a, a toddlers, adolescents, and these are all stages, uh, developmental stages that, you know, are replicated many, 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 many times. And so um, and so the idea is that there's actually developmental stages in technology that if you went to other planets around the galaxy, that, 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 that they would probably have similar paths through this, that, that they're kind of like just by the physics of things. Uh, you, you need to, you know, master some level of metal working to be able to make electricity right and so um they, they seem kind of obvious but there there might be you know it might get more complicated as you have more things on hand so the general idea is is that there is a um a, a sequence of more complicated forms that would follow that you have prerequisite prerequisite simpler ones required so that's one level and and what would be inevitable is is the the general forms of things rather than the particular specifics which would be inherently unpredictable so we would say that you know if you had a planet that had kind of a similar gravity to earth that the form of quadrupeds four feet four wheels is is a very stable form that's probably inevitable on the planet you know that that, that it's just going to be rediscovered because of the physics of this kind of constrain it and say that's the most stable configuration and we're going to see a lot of those so while a quadruped form could be inevitable a zebra or a particular kind of horse is not inevitable. That is completely random. You play the tape a thousand times, and each time will come something slightly different, because the specifics are much more governed by these chance mutations and stuff. Whereas the forms are kind of governed by the general physics and chemistry and these other constraints. And so we're saying the same things happening in technology that um, there are biases that. Given the form, once you have, you know, copper and electricity, you're going to try and make radio waves. Um, so you'll have radio, but the particulars of what spectrum you're using, and then the the, the character of like who owns it, or is it open source? Does is it international or national? All these other character aspects of it are not uh, inevitable. That means that we have choices about it, and those choices actually make a big difference to how we use this technology. So let's get a little bit into into this. What do you see today when it comes to technology as as being totally inevitable? And um, and maybe we can take some specifics. Yeah, uh, we sure. can talk about AI, for example. Yeah, yeah. And uh, and what on on the contrary is inevitable? Or should be inevitable, yeah. you know, and what to do about what's inevitable, kind of, which is the big question. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You're right. So, so I mean, yeah, I mean, you, you pointed it out. I mean, I would say that it's it's pretty inevitable that we will have um, sentience, artificial sentience, in part because evolution itself basically invented minds many times. It just kind of kept kept going back. It invented eyeballs. 30, 30 different times in nature and in the biological world it kept making it wants to make minds in this complicated way of learning very fast of adapting very fast and so um, we will be making minds but the 
character of those minds, how we teach them, again, who owns them, how they're regulated, um, to what degree do we, um, how do we train them? All these questions are not inevitable. We, there'll be differences. Uh, they'll make differences to us. Um, and so um, the character of AI is something that we ha- are choosing right now and have a choice about. Um, how, how they fit into our lives is a choice that we have and that we're making whether we know it or not. And I, you know, a bunch of people are forcing us to think about this before it arrives. And so I think we are, as a society, trying to shape AI, um, trying to determine the character of it. Um, and so, um, you know, ourselves right now, the two of us are talking about it, and we're part of that process of trying to decide what the character of it. We cannot stop it. We can't regulate it off. We can't prohibit it. Um, we can only steer it and, and affect its character. Is it, is it the biggest uh, tech topic, AI, or do you see other technology-related things that are inevitable that we should really have in mind? The, the biological, the, the genetic side of it is huge. And so um, I said earlier that, that, that we are humans, slightly technological. I, I believe that we actually have invented our humanity and we've changed ourselves genetically as we've gone along. And now we are kind of coming, beginning to, to accrue some tools that would allow us to modify and change us even more. So I think we're very malleable. I think humanity is a very malleable concept. And uh, I think this is early. This would be a later in a cent- the next hundred years. But I think we will ha- start to have to make decisions about what we want humans to be. And that will always be made in the, um, the context of AIs as we make synthetic intelligences do more and more things. They will be creative, they, but they will have a different kind of uh, sense of humor, a different kind of sense of creativity. They will be alien, but they nonetheless they will do things that we thought only humans could do, so that forces us to re-examine ourselves, to redefine ourselves, to maybe even change what we hope to be. So this issue of what do we want humans to be? What do we, not just what are we here for, but what do we want to become? That's a huge question that's unclear how we ask the question, how we answer it. So, so that's, that's, so I think the biological part of it is a equal big thing. Um, going on in, in terms of um, how, how we're going to change ourselves, how we become dependent on these, these kinds of uh, technologies. Um, so, yeah. But yeah. J- just to, uh, I'd like to be clear on this uh, because this reminds us, you know, of all the transhumanism, you know, movement where basically there is a mix between AI and uh, biotech and, you know, all these things and BIC. Uh, when you say it's inevitable, some people would argue that, um, that could be a decision to stop working on these um, so that it doesn't happen because the technology will not uh, update and upgrade itself. You know, it has to be, we are still at a stage where uh, it's it's still human minds that need to conceive it. Uh, So when you said it's inevitable, that means that it's inevitable that because we can do it, we will do it somehow, somewhere, or is it a different way of approaching it? It's inevitable because as long as we are making new things, and I don't, I, I, I think the, mm, first of all, it becomes easier easier to make new things. And secondly, um, I think the, uh, the, I would call it pressure, the, the inclination, the appetite for making new things, will continue that as we're making new things, um, the, th- that creates a space for new things to appear. So, so 
it's sort of like um, uh, what's the vi- picture I'd want? Um, the the inevitable the new technologies are, as long as we're making new things the new technologies will kind of appear um, without anybody kind of really trying too hard to do them. It's like, kind of like a lot of the electrical stuff. Yeah, it happens where, kind of by accident. Well, there's or, yeah, yeah. guys in the garage tinkering with things and they discover something. They weren't necessarily trying to invent uh, these big things. They were often, you know, little curiosities initially. And I think uh just given the our propensity human propensity to cherish novelty to become bored very easily um i think that we're going to continue to make new things forever and in that process of making things that gives room for technologies to to be born and once you have them being born, that then I think they follow this kind of inevitable process of um, uh, of becoming. So, so I, I don't see any way of stopping um, innovation. It's like th- prohibiting innovation. You can say, well, we can prohibit. In- We're not going to prohibit innovation, but just innovation in biotechnology. We're going to uh, outlaw certain things just as we've outlawed you know nuclear uh testing and um uh so so we're we're prohibiting and the problem with that is that when i did a study of prohibitions technological prohibitions it turned out that historically they were very short-lived they were always temporary while they you know while they did maybe um, for a moment um, stop things that were basically they were given up. So nuclear testing, even though we have stopped testing, we haven't really stopped nuclear development or even nuclear weapons, which are still being made and invented. So, I th- so the w- the way I think of it is is that technologies have different jobs, different different jobs that they do. And what we're trying to do is find the right job for each technology. It's like a little child that's born and you're trying to find the best match for them, what to do. And um, so we may, we may find different jobs for say uh, human cloning as a technology. We may prohibit certain manifestations of it, but not the technology itself. I think those are unstoppable. We're just going to get there. Yeah, yeah. Basically, what you're saying is that if we, when we can do it, we someone somewhere will do it. We will right. do it. And it's the same. Nuclear is, testing is a good example because actually, we stopped it when it was not necessary anymore because we had simulation, and, uh, and therefore right, we but, could. But we're still progress. developing nuclear weapons, yes. and so exactly. it's it's just one job that we don't need yeah. to do with that. And um, I can certainly imagine there be you know certain regulations about. Um, that we'll call, call human cloning about cloning with humans there that could be regulated there might be some things that we don't allow but we will have human clonings for a very simple reason that we already do they're called twins it's natural human cloning so we're perfectly comfortable with uh human cloning you know it, the funny thing is is if we didn't have natural twinning in humans and someone today invented a way of making human twins people would be in uproar they would be there would be pitchforks there would be demonstrations about uh making twins artificially if, if they didn't exist naturally um and so it's just a matter of um you know what yeah. we get used to uh, and this is where I had a question related to Amish, you know, the Amish community, because you spent you spent some time, I believe, with um, with the Amish, and who you say are people that are very interesting, that have a very interesting relationship to technology. And um, interestingly enough, in France last year, there was a debate uh, that's related to what we just discussed. There was a debate regarding to 5G and whether this is a technology that we really need to invest on and deploy in France as some people were arguing that we are collectively challenged to lower our consumption of energy. So 
don't go out there and you know like build structures that will help people consume more energy basically and the president macron basically at a conference said quote some people think that we should go back to the oil lamp i don't believe in the amish model and of course that created some kind of a buzz so just a, a few minutes on that what do you think of the amish model and isn't it a counterexample showing that the evolution ad and adoption of technology is not always inevitable, or at least for a group of humans, and that some humans can still decide the direction it should take, and, and should we? So the, the, the kind of stereotypical view of the Amish, the, the, the picture that we have, the metaphor that your president was referring to is this idea of the Amish um, eschewing or giving up, um, refusing to be modern. So they have um, horse and buggy, and they use, um, or ha used to use, kerosene, uh, oil lamps for light. And um, they did that uh, for kind of religious, cultural reasons as a way to show their separateness as, as kind of as kind of like what we call identity politics today. It was is a way of identifying themselves as, as separate. And they, these were kind of symbolic separations. So, so that's the, the picture of the Amish, and they're kind of known for you know, not adopting technology. But in fact, when you start to live with them, research them, it, the story is much more complicated and interesting. First of all, they, um, they are adopting technology, but just at a much slower rate. Um, the big thing now in the Amish is they, they now have solar power LED battery lights. They take this tool, um, cordless tool batteries, and they hook it up to a, um, a LED light. Um, and so they don't are not connected to the power grid. That keeps them separate. But they're actually using electric lights um, today in, in some parishes. And that's the other thing about the Amish is that they um, make these decisions about what technology they use or don't. Uh, Paris community by community. Um, the reason why I felt it was interesting to look at the Amish once I realized that they actually were using technology, but just at a slower rate and being was was that they were aware of the criteria that they were choosing, and they were explicit that they were choosing things. They made their choices as a whole community. Americans in general are much more individualistic, and so we kind of do it as individuals. But I think we um, can learn something from the Amish in understanding um, what our own criteria are and having a set of criteria to say, well, what is it that we want technology to do? So the Amish criteria, what they were deciding was two two factors that they looked at for every new technology coming along, whether it's computers or smartphones or genetic engineering. And that was, will this technology um, help me s stay at home with my family, work at home? So that they really have emphasis. And their dream is that they would have every meal, breakfast, lunch, and dinner with their children until the children left. So that was the that was the dream. And so they, they was, does this technology, would this allow us to work in the backyard or work at home or work on the farm and have every meal with our children? And so um, if it's yes, then they would use it. And they are basically kind of deciding that cell phones help them do that. Because the second criteria is, does this also keep our community together close to each other and dependent on each other. So the reason why they have horse and buggy is because they can only go 17 miles uh, in a day. And so they have to shop and go to the doctor and do everything within that 17 mile radius. They can't go any further and that keeps the community together. So it's not that they have a particular love of horses or whatever. It's that it, that constraint keeps their community very, very strong. And they are finding that actually weirdly cell phones, not the smartphones, but kind of cell phones allow them to do that because they have brothers and sisters all over and they can kind of maintain their community with cell phones. And so they are slowly adopting cell phones. 
Yeah, so so that's a very good example of how uh, a community, because that that's of course that's very difficult to do and impossible to do at a, at the scale of the civilization, uh, but that can exist at at, a, at the scale of a community on to think of how do we want to live and therefore what is the technology that we want. Right, exactly. And, and that have a, another important question that's related to this indirectly. Um, and I really want to have your, your view on this. When it comes to predicting our probable future, you know, the most interesting people I've, I've come across so far usually start with the concept of energy in mind. And indeed, that's because there's an obvious relationship between how energy, how much energy we can use and how complex and, and big our systems can be. And our modern global civilization, its infrastructures and its technology only exist at this scale because we have been burning fossil fuel basically for 150 years. And now that we passed peak oil and uh, there will be a challenge on energy and also now that we should very quickly decrease our emissions and therefore consumption of, of, of energy to avoid you know, catastrophic climate change, some people say that we won't be able to create more complexity and that therefore what is inevitable is a great simplification and that includes technology according to to, to some of them and you have a low-tech movement etc what do you think of this view and how much do you take in in account into account energy and the constraint that could come with it in your models so I, I, I think the, the the general view of the what's the word I want the the boon the 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 um the gift that we've gotten from cheap energy is un not fully appreciated it's underestimated in terms of if you just look at the population curve of the last couple hundred years with this huge exponential yeah exponential growth of population that's basically the exponential growth of oil that's just that's just been powered by cheap oil if we did not have on this planet a source of cheap fuel oil fuel we wouldn't have had that population explosion it's in fact one of the kind of interesting thought experiments is that can you imagine a civilization recurring somewhere where they only had wood to burn uh on another planet where they didn't have deep reserves of oil could they have ever ever gotten to um nuclear energy i mean can you get the nuclear energy if you don't have oil in between so um it's it's an interesting thought experiment but um it's true that the current prosperity that we've had has been riding on the back of oil and it's not i mean there's plenty of oil but we're having peak oil not because there's a shortage of it on the planet but simply because we understand that we can't burn it um we can't keep burning it right and it's uh or coal that the burning things or energy is just a really bad way to do it so we're going to we're shifting to um, different sources of energy and we'll return eventually to nuclear fission and hopefully we'll have nuclear fusion so the the problem with that is that the um the the greenhouse effect that we have is not is in part because we're making co2 but not entirely there's another aspect of it that just comes from the waste heat of generating energy so so even if we had a non uh polluting source just the fact that we have like you know, like say it was a nuclear fusion just the waste heat from nuclear fusion would be a problem for us and if you you know if you had infinite free energy that would be a huge problem um that just just you know it's like kind of like having a computer where you have as it gets denser and better and better it heat radiation becomes more and more of an issue of how do you prevent it from melting itself and so um so so the long term the very very long term limit is is one of um cooling keeping the planet cool as we become more energy in, intensive that's not so much a um that's not an immediate um, hurdle. The immediate hurdle is getting off of uh, burning things as, as their source of energy as fast as possible. Yes, but so 
if you start burning things, and which is, which is what we should be doing, since right. we still depend eighty percent on fossil fuel, right? Um, and since there is a strong correlation with how complex uh, the civilization can be and how much energy we put into right. the system, uh -huh. some people would say inevitably either we decrease the size of the population and keep the same level of complexity because you know we you burn uh, as much energy per person either you decrease the level of complexity overall and therefore these people say these scenarios where you have ai everywhere uh, since this ai consume a lot of energy never happen oh well no that's not true at all so, so a couple of things w one is We'll still have plenty of energy. We'll just have nuclear energy and then later on fusion energy. So there's, <clears throat> there'll be, there's plenty. I mean, we'll have a, we have the transition period in between where um, we're going to be relying more on the renewables, but um, uh, we, we, you know, nuclear is, is we can build as safe, uh, powerful nuclear that, that, that can fill all the energy needs that we want. AI itself does not really take up that much energy um, overall. It's it's not really um, it's not it's not it's not going to be a big uh, percentage of of the total thing. I think still moving atoms around that is you know the the, the flying that we do the, the the jet setting around the world moving materials will will always and heating you know just just heating air conditioning the, the, the those will still always be the the majority of the the use of energy the, the ai is it's, it's not really significant in terms of the planet yeah so if i if i hear you basically what you say is that um Inevitably, there may be simplification on, uh, related to using less energy, so less flying around, less transportation. No, no. Less, well, well you know, I, I don't. No, I don't think we're going to necessarily do even less. We do it more efficiently, but we do more. the the other The other thing that is happening, and and this is something we I think is more of a problem, an opportunity. But we're going we're headed into a population uh, implosion on the planet where where. Um, in uh, we're we first of all we're aging very fast the peak youth on this planet was in 1972 and every year the average age on the humans is, is increasing and we see no end we, we, we see no counter force we've seen nothing that on the planet that's changed um to increase um you know modern people to have more babies on average and so the replacement level is going below in every country, um, every developed country, and even the developing countries, they are rapidly um, changing their fertility. And so, the the issue is 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 that we have nowhere been able to reverse that. Nothing we've done so far in any country, paying people to have babies. Um, I think China may even flip and. Are to trying to command mandate people to have babies. I don't think that's going to work either, and so um, that and because of the the general momentum of demographics, where it takes <clears throat> almost twenty five years for things to kind of show up, um, even though you can see the beginnings of them now, uh, the the momentum and demographic momentum is that we are headed to. Um, a situation where there are basically fewer and fewer humans born on the planet every year. And as I said, unless we decide to, you know, I don't know, grow babies outside of mothers, um, which is possible. Um, we there, but you still have to raise them. Somebody has to raise them right now for the next mm, century next hundred years we're headed towards having fewer and fewer people on the planet every year and um uh that's going to be a very challenging um time because so far on our planet in our history our short history we have always ha had uh rising We've always the only periods of rising living standards have always been with rising population, <clears throat> and so we don't have any experience with rising living standards while the population goes down. 
And so we need kind of like a new form of capitalism or economy where you are selling to fewer people. Your, your, your customer base is shrinking every year. The market's shrinking every year. The number of people available to work are shrinking every year. And yet you're growing in some capacity. That is something we don't know how to do yet. Uh, we're getting to the end. Uh, just a couple more questions. I, I know you actually think that sometimes questions are more important than answers. I don't know where I heard you say that. So what is the most important question that we should all work on right now or something that we are not seeing coming? Mm, that's a great question. Um, what should we work on that we don't? most people don't see coming? Um, hmm. Yes, I think we should be working on world government. I think um, we are at the point where we have planetary problems and we need planetary solutions, global scale problems. With, we need global scale solutions and we need a mechanism to accomplish that. And I think, uh, you know, these problems are beyond a nation state, even a big one, a big bully one like America. We, we just have to have global ways of doing things, global ways to enforce laws and fairness, global ways of collaborating. And um, there is a, a deep suspicion of global government in the U.S. and probably throughout the world. And, you know, my friends on the left don't want global government. My friends on the right don't. And I think we need it. I think this is... Uh, an absolute essential thing, but but in truth, I have no idea how you could have a representative government with seven billion people. It just doesn't. It's like I don't know how to do that. I, I can't see it. It seems hard. There's all these issues about how do you opt out, and so um, so I think we need great minds beginning to work on the problem of how do we have a fair, equitable, powerful, effective world government because some of the things that we're entering into climate chain among them but not the only one like cyber security like security and war war is a stupid stupid thing run by nation states who believe that they're each sovereign which is silly and stupid and insane and a disease and so um what we need to have is uh people thinking about how we have a really good world government and most people are completely allergic to that idea Yeah, it's a challenging. <laughs> I don't see how this could this could happen. I don't see the beginning of it, but maybe yeah, it's it's a very good question. It doesn't mean that there is an answer, but uh, as you said, it's a uh, it starts with a good question. La last one, I have. I don't know if you if you familiar with that, but basically, I have two young daughters, and I always ask this to to the people I talk to. What should I tell them? What are the main skills or behaviors you know that we should teach young children or to adapt to the coming world. Yes. So, so I think you mentioned one already, which is um, you want to teach them. I think answers are free and cheap. They can find it with Google. <laughs> uh, but you want to be able to ask really good questions. You want to, to um, and, and a lot of, you know, any consultant will tell you that, that the half of the, the problem in a very tricky um, thing you have to do is, is, getting the, to the right question. What is the real question that we're trying to solve here? Because um, it's often not the question you think at first. So um, learning how to ask questions and, and having that kind of inquisitive mind of uh, questioning your own assumptions is huge. And then questioning authority, of course, is part of um, uh I think, you know, uh, the modern the modern mind, um, not to assume that what we've done uh, is what we should keep doing. So, um, so that kind of a questioning stance, I think, is one. The second thing I think uh, is kind of useful for, uh, well, for, for, first of all, I, I think that in terms of like parenting, um, under a certain age, like say, you know, up into elementary school, I don't think it really matters much about what you teach them in terms of knowledge. I think it's all about character. You know, forming their character is really the essential thing there. And the, 
the knowledge and that stuff is just the vehicle for forming character. And so um, you want to be, you know, making sure that they're kind of, they've got grit and perseverance and have, you can teach them optimism. There's something called learned optimism where taking the optimistic stance is, is very, very important. Um, so, so, so all those things I think are kind of more important than the knowledge at, at the lower ages. Um, and then, you know, higher high school and beyond or whatever. I think, um, I, I think there's something we should be um, teaching, which is um, uh, uh, something I call learning how to learn uh, or learning how you learn. So this meta level of learning is something that I still don't know and I wish I knew, which is I think every person should be able to to um, figure out how they learn best. So, uh, so what are the kinds of steps that I need to do to learn a language? For me, I'm maybe more audio based than uh, textually based, or maybe I'm more kinetic learner than I am uh, in reading. And so, um, schools should be teaching us how to figure out how we learn best and the, the different kinds of things, so that this idea of learning how I learn best, so that when I leave, I know what I need to do. I know how many hours of sleep I need after trying to memorize something. I, I've measured that. I've tested that. I've, I've I've been practicing that. So that's a known thing. It's kind of like a performance for an athlete where you are really kind of tuning your body and you know what the rest and the rep cycles are. Well, we need to do that for learning. And I think that's the major skill that your daughters and everyone else knows is this ability to know how to optimize their own learning. That's a very good takeaway. Thank you for that. And, and last questions, two books that everyone should read. Everybody, including outside the West, should at one time in their life read the Bible. It's this hugely influential book on our culture. And no matter what you think it says, it doesn't say that. <laughs> uh, so read it yourself. It's a amazing, disturbing, awesome, astounding book. And it's such a core part of Western culture and even modern culture that you owe it to yourself to read it on your own for yourself. That's one. Um, another book that everybody should read. Um, a book that when I read it uh, maybe a couple of years ago, I said, I said, this book is going to flip the culture. And it was Michael Pollan's um, How to Change Your Mind, which, despite the title, is really about psychedelics. And he presented the case for psychedelics. And I said, this is going to work. This is actually going to flip the culture. And we're seeing exactly that happen right now where – Marijuana is being legalized. Psychedelics are now being approved for research. Um, and so it's, and, and I think psychedelics are a technology that have been um, weirdly uh, um, outlawed and um, are important. And so here, so this is a book that if you have, you know, if you're kind of wondering about what's going on, if you're skeptical or whatever it is, um, read this book because I think it, does make an argument that will convince you so two kind of spiritual books spiritual in a way uh, psychological i would say psychological okay thank you so much kevin for your time and uh yeah i hope we talk again you're very welcome thank you for your great questions voilà j'espère que cet épisode vous a plu vous pouvez comme d'habitude retrouver les notes détaillées et les infos complémentaires sur sismic.fr. Si le podcast vous plaît, parlez-en, mettez une note sur Apple Podcast et pour ne rien rater, rejoignez-moi sur les réseaux sociaux ou abonnez-vous à la newsletter. Je suis Julien Devorex, Sismic est un podcast indépendant et je me consacre désormais entièrement à ce projet. Pour me soutenir dans cette démarche et rejoindre la communauté privée Slack, vous pouvez faire un don à partir du site. Enfin, si vous souhaitez échanger avec moi ou me solliciter pour une conférence, contactez-moi pour en parler. Merci encore pour votre écoute et à bientôt dans un autre épisode. <rire> changer le monde <rire> quelle drôle l'idée il est très bien comme ça le monde pourrait changer 